Music. Thank you very much. So, music, as I said. Um, how many of you in here um, would consider themselves uh, to be musicians in some way? Well, quite a lot of hands. I expected your hand to go up, Paul. <laughs> um, great. So, how many of you uh, actively play an instrument on a regular basis? Um, so, there should be, you know, there are a little more a few more hands there because, you know, I, I don't consider myself a musician somehow. Um, <coughs> not properly trained and all. Um, but usually uh, when I speak to a crowd like this, there are an astonishing number of hands going up and you're, you're not an exception here. And I, I find this kind of interesting because I think playing music and, and uh, programming computers somehow goes well together. I, I still didn't figure it out completely, but you know, sometimes a job is very stressing and music can be very relaxing. And on the other hand, a lot of music is based on mathematics and we usually like mathematics and stuff like that. So uh, it goes well together, I think. Um, now with myself, <coughs> sorry, <laughs> my, my, uh, I have a little cold here. My voice might be failing. Um, so I'm going to play a bit more music later on so I don't have to talk. Um, so myself, I started learning to play the flute in elementary school. Who, who, who shares this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I hated it. I hated it. I really hated it. And so uh, as soon as I could quit this, I quit it. And I have never started to learn an instrument again. It's, it's just, I, uh, I, I cannot tell you how much I hated it. And I, I, I basically, uh, so this is, uh, I have probably noted it wrong, but this is the, the tune and the fourth, uh, uh, in the, wh what do you say, uh, fourth uh, year in school, uh, we had to play our best uh, flute tune we were able to do. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, that was one I learned in first grade, and I played it just because I was so fed up with this. So anyway, so I stopped doing music at all for a few years, and then I somehow uh, got back into it, and uh, the reason was that I got my first home computer, which was, of course, looking at my age, a C64. Um, who else uh, uh, had a C64? Uh, just a few hands. How many of you are actually born in the 70s? This kind of interesting information. Ah, yeah. 
getting old, shit. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, we had this awesome magazine in Germany called 64er Magazine. Uh, who remembers that? Uh, okay, a few hands. And you know that back in the days, um, so when you found computer listings in computer magazines, they were actually not there to tell a point or something, but to, for you to type into your computer to get new programs. That was the main way of distributing software. Like printing listings in magazine. Let that sink in for a minute if you're born in the 90s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, this magazine even had their own program that enabled you to input binary data. So they had this program where you would type in large columns of, uh, of uh, hex numbers with checksums um, to input a program that was not written in basic, so you couldn't really type it into the computer easily. And I did that with one program because I really, really wanted to have this program, and it took me about two weeks to type in this several page long hex listing. And the program was called Sound Monitor. Anyone remember that? Uh, I thought so. It was written by a gentleman called uh, Chris Hillsback. Does that name ring a bell for anyone? OK. Uh, I thought so. So if you have never heard that name, he is the guy who wrote the soundtrack for games like Great Giant of Sisters, you've probably heard, didn't hear of that either. Uh, <laughs> Tarakin, have you heard of that? Well, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, uh, he was pretty popular at that time. And it was the first freely available software to do proper music on the C64, um, where you can basically do everything with the hardware that the hardware is actually able to do. And the hardware, the sound hardware in the C64 was a three-voice analog synthesizer with filters and all. And uh, that's that's the most amazing sound source you can have uh, in the 90s, uh, in the 80s. And so um, I started making music with this tool. And then I, later on, I got an Amiga. So I'm that type of guy, uh, not an Atari, which would be the be better choice probably for making music. But this Amiga had uh, four digital voices, and you could do awesome stuff with it. And there was this free f uh, software called ProTracker. And the interface to put in music looks like this. And it's, it's basically columns of numbers. And Sound Monitor was a very, very thinly disguised machine monitor with some, some uh, yeah, basic ways to input notes. And it looked a little like this. And ProTracker just improved a little bit in that it had buttons you could actually click with a mouse to do certain things. But apart from that, it's, it's just writing down numbers to make music. And I did that throughout the whole 90s into the 2000s. Um, and made a lot of music with that. And it's, yeah, it's, you can see notes there and octaves, and you can see the sample number it should play, and then there are three columns to do effects on top of that, and then there's the next column, and you had four tracks of these, and very, very basic way to input sound. And at some point, uh, I thought, well, this, is, this actually looks an awful lot like programming, you know? It's, it's just typing in stuff to instruct the computer to do something. And wouldn't it be awesome to just write code to make music? And I wasn't the only one to think that. And so somewhere uh, around, I would say, mid-90s maybe, I, I don't know the exact history of this, people started building uh, live coding environments for music. And um, I. I looked at a few of them, and probably the, uh, the emergence of these tools came together with the emergence of being able to calculate sounds in real time on a computer. That wasn't possible before the mid-90s, something like that. So you could do music without having any external hardware. That was unthinkable at that time. Um, and suddenly, we could do it, and then it makes an awful lot of sense to, to try to do live coding with it. <laughs> Um, one of the m best known uh, live coding tools for the Mac is Impromptu. It's based on Scheme. Um, and then there's a thing called uh, Super Collider. If you're interested in this type of stuff, please take a look at it. Super Collider is super awesome and super complicated and uh, really hard to get into. And then there's this other thing, and I forgot to look up the name, and I could beat myself up for it, um, which is based on Clojure, so another Lisp dialect. Um, and is written on top of uh, Super Collider. Does anyone know the name and could shout it to me? Uh, 
That was my chance. So, Overtone, right. It's called Overtone. Thank you very much. Uh, he, he Googled it. <laughs> Great. You're my, you're my Google assistant from now on. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So, uh, um, when, I, when I, in this February, had the chance to, to play a live gig with uh, two other gentlemen who were playing um, accordion and electric bass uh, at a post-conference event at the Google campus in Tel Aviv, I thought, oh, maybe it's time to come up with something that allows live coding in the browser. And so I came up with this very, very basic system. Uh, it's not a lot of code, actually. It's on GitHub. And uh, I'm going to show you some music. So the thing with live coding music is that it takes a lot of time. And I thought I could probably do it from scratch for you. Turns out I'm uh, not unnervous enough to do that. So <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to show you a bit what, what this is doing. So um, the thing about live coding is, uh, and, and using something like JavaScript for doing this, is that you can actually use code to produce stuff, obviously. And so this, uh, you can take an array and then um, feed it into something else. And ARP is just a small ex abstraction I wrote to, to build an arpeggiator, if that rings a bell. And it sounds like this. And what this, what this does here is, so uh, SpreadSynth is just another abstraction that does, uh, takes a few um, oscillators, puts it into a few filters. And there's the thing about coding against the Web Audio API, if you've ever done that, the code is really verbose. And it's really hard to, to cut it down. So it's, it's procedural code to set up stuff. Uh, it's, yeah, it's almost de declarative, more or less. And so it's really good if you're doing live coding to abstract it away in things that are a little easier uh, on, on the eye and on the, on the fingers. So um, I'm going to start this again and just uh, <laughs> improvise a little bit on this. again, just because I can. It's, it's playing a sample. I, it's, it's, I, thank you for the applause, but it's actually, you know, it's... And the cool thing, again, it's, it's uh, you know, it's code and mathematics, so what about if I mess this up a little bit? And it's like... Much more interesting. I, I you know, I, I like techno, but um, that won't work.
So finally, my hands are in a state where I can actually type things. That's good. That's good. Um, so let's talk a little bit, or let me talk a little bit about the technology behind this. So this is pattern-based music, and uh, this is very, you know, it's since since uh, Roland uh, built these awesome drum machines called 808 and 909, um, this has been like the modus operandi for for electronic electronic music, uh, at least in the drum section. And so this is a very simple drum pattern. And uh, the characteristics of this is that you have slots in time where you can attach events to. And usually the events is trigger a sample or trigger a note or something. And <coughs> so this is one thing you, you have to do when you want to build a system like this. You have to have a possibility to schedule events at certain times. And the Web Audio API is pretty good at that. So that's, that's kind of cool. Now, usually music uh, can be a lot more interesting than that by varying things in between. And, you know, this could, this could be everything. You know, this, this is a, not a sine wave. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> this is something I came up with last late night, uh, I guess. So it's, it's a modulation of some kind of parameter. It could be a filter frequency. It could be the frequency of a note or something. But the... Um, the, the most important part here is that um, you want to vary things over the boundaries of these pattern slots. So there, need, there needs to be a way to schedule not only events at certain times, but also changes over time. And luckily, um, the Web Audio API has, have, has covered. So this is my very scientific uh, diagram of how uh, stuff in the Web Audio API works. and I now realize that probably you can't read the names of the methods I wrote down there. <laughs> uh, too bad. <laughs> so uh, if you, how many ha of you have seen the talk from Jan at Reject.js uh, on Thursday? So a few. Um, so uh, there, uh, there is this idea that uh, the, the audio context, which is the, the basic object from which you construct all the objects in the Web Audio API has this idea of its own time context. And you can always ask it what time it is. That's pretty kind of good. What time is it? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know, five, sec five seconds and 50 milliseconds since uh, I've been started. And uh, this is current time. So it's an attribute you can just read out, and it gives you the current time. Now, with this, you can actually start scheduling things in the future, because now you know, OK, this is now, and I want to start something in two seconds, and I just take current time and add two seconds to it. And it's floating point uh, mathematics. So um, in theory, it should get really, really imprecise after a long time. And I've seen bugs uh, on browser uh, bug trackers that actually try to deal with this, because it's kind of hairy. So if you let it run for two hours and it get, gets off by more than 20 milliseconds or so, the beat starts to crumble, and that's not good. And now, if you want to start um, a sound and stop a sound, you can do so by just saying, OK, current time plus x. And that's the top one. So you have a start and a stop event. Now, if you want to change parameters, most of the parameters in the Web Audio API are, are what, what's called an audio param element, um, audio param class which is kind of cool because it allows you to schedule not only events, but also changes into the future. And so there is, uh, if you say dot value, you've probably seen me typing that once. Um, it just sets the value immediately. If you say set value at time, that's a, that's a method call, um, then you can say, OK, I want this value to be x at time uh, z, uh, y. And that's uh, and it, it the the idea is that it changes the value in a way that the audio doesn't click. So it, it will not change it immediately, like from one to zero, but from one to zero in like a few milliseconds. And that's kind of nice because you don't have to worry about that. And uh, then you have also the possibility to say, okay, I want this value to gradually change over time. And there are linear changes, so linear ramp to value at time. Um, that's a pretty great uh, method name, if you ask me. Uh, 
and exponential ramp to value at time, and then there are a few others that allow you to, uh, to ev be even more uh, creative with these things. And the exponential one is extremely interesting because in music you always you, uh, often deal with values like frequencies or so where it makes a lot of sense to not linearly interpolate but do it exponentially. So that's kind of uh, very cool um, to have. And um, with this you can actually do uh, best of both worlds. So you can schedule events uh, on, on t um, precise timings and then change values over time. And everything you've heard, like the small uh, filter phase at, at the start of a note, that is basically me scheduling filter changes over time, and that's all happening in my abstractions. And, and uh, they are quite easy to handle. Now, there's a problem. Um, if you want to actually make music and change parameters over time in real time, let's say you have this controller and you want to change things with knobs, then you suddenly have a problem of, well, I've ch I can schedule things in the future, but what do I do with these button uh, thingies here? And, uh, or with, with knobs or with sliders or whatever. And it, that's actually a problem that is not very easy to solve um, for reasons that are quite complex. Um, trying to explain them anyway. <laughs> so uh, there are basically two categories of categories of, of uh, nodes in the Web Audio API. One is the generator part, which are uh, disposable. So you start a sound, you stop a sound, and the object is basically gone or can be, can be thrown away because you cannot start it again. It's not, it's not reusable. And the problem with that is if I want to attach a value in real time to it, I have to reattach it every time I create a new object. And this can be quite complicated. And um, then there's this other category like filters or, or effects that can actually exist for a very long time. And there, it's not so much of a problem because you have that one object you can talk to at all time. And I really didn't solve this problem uh, very good. Um, so I, to, to show you that it's, it's basically possible to do that, I have a last example um, that will hopefully show a few of these things uh, better. So again, um, I, I don't start from scratch because I don't want to bore you too, for too long here. So you've heard that before. And the clap snare you're hearing there is actually playing through a reverb filter. Um, and uh, this, this filter has a, um, an attribute called mix. Um, and I, I'm going to try and attach something to it. And I hope this works. So this is a leap motion, um, and there's this JavaScript library that allows you to, to do leap motion stuff uh, in the browser, and I've just attached it. So this, this method looks quite complicated, but that's just because I have to kind of traverse the object graph of this frame that comes from the sensor, and uh, I need to do it in a way that doesn't crash if the object is actually not there. So that's the best thing I came up with. Now let's turn it into music.
Thank you very much.